Welcome, dear listeners, to the third season premiere of the Carolina Haynes Podcast, brought to you by Rick Epic Productions and A Darker World. I'm your host, Dan Sellers. Bladenboro, North Carolina, is the very definition of a one-stoplight town. During the 2017 census, Bladenboro reported a population of just 1,657 people. Fifty years ago, it was about half that. But in the early 50s, Bladenboro was overrun by almost a thousand hunters after a series of bizarre animal attacks put this sleepy little town in the national spotlight. It began in the waning days of 1953. On December 29th, a woman heard her dogs barking and whimpering. She investigated and saw a large, cat-like creature running off into the swampy forest that surrounds Bladenboro. That was the first reported sighting of the creature that would come to be known as the Vampire Beast of Bladenboro. Over the next week and a half, the police department received report after report of attacks by an animal like a bear or panther. The creature was described as cat-like with very dark fur and somewhere between three and five feet long. A creature killed two of Woody Storm's dogs. DG Pact saw an animal attack another dog and pull it into the woods. Two of Johnny Voss's dogs were also killed. Then, four more dogs were killed. And it wasn't just dogs. Owners also reported that a pet rabbit, some goats, calves, and a couple hogs had been killed in the same manner, just as the dogs. Yes, all of the victims had died in the same way. Their skulls had been crushed, and the body was completely drained of blood. Then, it attacked a human. Mr. and Mrs. Kinslaw heard their dogs baying one night and went out to see what the ruckus was about. Mrs. Kinslaw said that a large cat-like creature rushed toward her, but her husband scared it away. They said that it had a scream, quote, like a woman with a knife stuck in her back, end quote. After this, many people were too scared to come out of their houses after dark. The story was picked up by the newspapers and nearly a thousand hunters descended on the small community of barely 900 residents. But none of them really knew exactly what they were hunting. Speculation included the infamous and extinct Carolina Panther and the also extinct Eastern Carolina Cougar or perhaps a coyote or a large wolf. The hunters decided it would serve best to be safe rather than sorry. So, in a scene straight out of the movie Jaws, they simply went out into the woods and shot anything that moved. It was a wonder that nobody was killed. Mayor Bob Fussell acknowledged that things had gotten out of control. So, he and Police Chief Roy Forrest took a large bobcat that had been killed, raised it up the town flagpole, and declared the beast dead. No one who witnessed the beast of Bladenboro believed that the bobcat was actually the culprit. The bobcat only weighed 25 pounds, a quarter of the size of the beast reported by the witnesses. It was much too small to have killed those animals. However, 
no further animal attacks were reported. And, after about another week or so, the hunter slowly dissipated and things in Bladenboro returned to normal. Perhaps the hunters had simply made such a racket that they drove the animal far enough into the swampy woods where it was no longer a danger to populated areas. Even though the beast of Bladenboro became the best known mysterious feline of the Carolinas, strange animal attacks had been reported around the state nearly a hundred years before the 1954 incident. Most of these attacks were blamed on the infamous Wampus Cat, which you may remember from Season 2, or a Santer, which was sort of a catch-all phrase of the time for a mysterious feline. A story from 1884 may offer some clue as to the creature's origins. When a pair of black tigers escaped from a circus traveling through Virginia, they were last seen headed toward the Great Dismal Swamp, which is split by the Virginia-North Carolina border. Four months later, a Wilmington man believed he killed one of the escaped animals. Quote, It was a fierce-looking brute, even in death. Black in color, a male, and measures six feet, six inches in length, from the end of the nose to the tip of the tail. End quote. A couple months later, a second black tiger was killed in Sampson County. But the story doesn't end there. A month later, a third black tiger was killed in Greensville County, Virginia. But only two tigers were reported as missing. Could there have been more escaped tigers? In the six months that they were missing, the tigers covered a distance of at least 250 miles. Could they have bred with the native wildcat to produce the infamous vampire beast? A lot of people don't believe that the beast of Bladenboro ever existed. They believe that the entire thing was a hoax perpetrated by the mayor himself. You see, Mayor Fussell just happened to own the only movie theater in town, and they just happened to be playing a movie called The Big Cat during this crisis. In fact, after hanging the bobcat from the flagpole, the mayor was quoted as saying, Now you can see the cat. We've got him on our screen. And in Technicolor. It was Mayor Fussell who first reported the incidents to the newspapers. Many years later, the mayor would describe the beast as 10% real and 90% imagination. He confessed that, quote, a little publicity never hurt a small town. End quote. But just as the legend of the vampire beast of Bladenboro was about to go down in the record books as the largest snipe hunt in history, the beast returned. This time in the Piedmont Triad. Starting in 2004, several North Carolina cities have reported tax very similar to the Beast of Bladenboro. In Bolivia, North Carolina, five dogs were killed, including two large, powerful pit bulls. Their heads were crushed and their blood drained. One of the 120-pound pit bulls was found in his owner's front yard the man strapped his pet onto the back of an ATV, drove it out into the woods, and buried it. The man was shocked the following morning to find that something had exhumed the pit bull and placed it back in the exact spot where it had been found the previous day. Other attacks were reported in 
in Charlotte, Lexington, Ashboro, and finally Greensboro, where several of Billy Yow's goats were killed in a manner consistent with a vampire beast. Unlike Mayor Fussell, Billy Yow was a credible witness. At the time, he served as a Guilford County Commissioner. Before these newer reports subsided, the beast was believed responsible for killing over 50 animals, some as large as cows and horses. Is the beast of Bolivia and the vampire bat of Greensboro the same animal that was dubbed as the beast of Bladenboro? If so, why the 50-year lull in reported sightings? Were these later attacks a product of the Bladenboro's beast's offspring? Unless one of these animals is killed or captured, we'll probably never know. In 2007, the History Channel show Monster Quest ran an episode titled Vampire Beast in which they investigated these reports and compared them to the 1954 Bladenboro attacks. As with most television shows featuring cryptids, the Monster Quest team was unable to obtain sufficient evidence to identify the species of beasts responsible for the killings. Also, prior to his death, crocodile hunter Steve Irwin also planned to film a show featuring the vampire beast of the Carolinas. A more traditional tale of vampires comes out of Charleston, Tennessee. But this story is no less bizarre or mysterious than the Beast of Bladenboro. The 1920s saw a huge push across the nation for road improvements to accommodate the growing automobile industry. Bradley County, Tennessee was no exception. One afternoon while widening the Upper River Road, the crew made a startling discovery. They found the remains of a woman, a petrified woman. Now I'm not going to go into the scientific process of petrification, but it typically takes a long time, a really long time but the woman appeared to be relatively modern, certainly within the previous 50 years. Adding to the mystery was the fact that the woman had a wooden stake driven through her heart, which had also petrified. The adjacent property was owned by the Camp family. Authorities questioned the current Camp family residence, but they claimed to know nothing about it. If their father had ever known who the woman buried on the property was, or why she had been treated as a vampire, he never mentioned it to them. No one else in the neighborhood could even recall there being so much as a rumor of vampires. The Appalachian Mountains are full of superstitious tales and legends, some originating from the Native Americans going back centuries. Yet nowhere are there any mention of vampires. The vampire of Bradley County remains a mystery to this day. To learn more about the vampire beast of Bladenboro, check out Haunted Historic Greensboro by Teresa Bain. There's also Monsters of North Carolina, Mysterious Creatures in the Tar Heel State by John Hare. You can check out WeekendWeird.com, NorthCarolinaGhost.com, and the Reddit page on Unsolved Mysteries. This episode was researched and written by Jeff Cochran. It was produced and hosted by me, Dan Sellers. 
You can find everything that my company's up to at RayCafeProductions.com. And you can find more about Jeff's projects at adarkerworld.com. Check out our sister show, the Bree Havoc Film Buffs Podcast. It's a show about movies by fledgling filmmakers. Hosted by yours truly and my producing partner, Sammy Castle. If you enjoy this show, then do us a favor and share it with your friends. And don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes as well. And if you'd like to take your support a step further, then by all means, visit our Patreon page to find ways in which you can contribute to all our ongoing efforts. That's patreon.com slash wreak havoc. You can find more about this show at our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Carolina Hanks. We're on Instagram at wreak havoc productions, and I'm on Twitter at Hank vs. The Undead. And as always, I enjoy hearing from fans of the show. You can ask me questions or send your feedback about what you like or don't like about the show at recapitproductions at gmail.com. We'll be back in two weeks with another tale about those things that go bump in the night. <laughs> <laughs>